my talk is entitled, as Jim has just said, uh, Anxieties uh, and Issues Between Russia and Europe. Um, and there's plenty of both. Uh, I will focus on those things in the 24 minutes remaining. And I will uh, leave the uh, very relevant and very important issues pertaining to the US-Russia relationship, such as Iran and some of the other things, to the Q&A uh, section of this, uh, 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 of this talk. Uh, let me talk about uh, Russia in Europe or Russia and Europe, which I find a very interesting uh, juxtaposition of uh, notions. Uh, back in the 1990s, a lot of uh, Russians uh, viewed uh, Europe as, as a home to which uh, they were headed after having spent uh, three quarters of a century in the communist limbo um, named uh, so, uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and the principal theme in those days was that of integration. Uh, Russia and the Russians uh, longed to be admitted to uh, all and every club, all uh, and uh, clubs that uh, existed in, in the Western world. Um, 10 years later, or maybe more, 12 years later, the mood has changed. And in the 2000s, the um, uh, principal theme in Russia is uh, not so much to belong as to be. And uh, the stress is so much more on independence and identity, not so much on integration. Where integration is uh, mentioned this is about integration into the wider world, not integration into any particular part of the world. Um, there was probably no other document that has shaped the thinking of the Russian uh, establishment these days as the uh, Goldman Sachs report back in 2003, which talked about the the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, as the rising emerging economies that would uh, gradually overtake the uh, more established and richer um, countries of uh, primarily Western Europe, and then uh, come very close to uh, the, the United States. Uh, in his uh, uh, very interesting speech in Munich, Earlier this month, President Putin was talking as if he were a spokesman, at least, if not the leader of this BRIC group. Uh, he was talking about um, China and India, Brazil, and Russia as the new wave in international politics. And he was clearly aiming to ride at the top of that wave. Um, NATO. Uh, in, two, in 1991, uh, as the era of the Soviet Union was uh, winding down and the new Russian Federation was, uh, uh, was just emerging, President Yeltsin, who succeeded Gorbachev in the Kremlin, uh, sent a cable to the NATO Secretary General, which uh, contained a phrase that Russia believed uh, it could become a member of the, of the, of the uh, Atlantic Alliance in the near future. There was no reaction. Two weeks later, another cable came from Moscow, signed by President Yeltsin, and it said that uh, the previous cable uh, had uh, contained uh, a misprint. So indeed, uh, Russia did not believe that it would become a member of the alliance in the near future. That was very crude and maybe naive diplomacy, but that, um, that allowed the Russian leadership to test the waters and, um, well, and then live with the result of that test. Um, 10 years later, President Putin, that was after 9-11, um, had a conversation with the NATO Secretary General and he was basically um, um, restating 
the Yeltsin question. And the answer that he was given was that, um, well, if Russia so wished to join, um, it had to join the queue, uh, which effectively killed the, the discussion. And um, it has not been um, revisited um, ever since. The, in, in the thinking of so many Russians, um, the thing that um, really um, encapsulated uh, the Western, uh, i.e., uh, American and European um, attitude toward Russia was NATO enlargement. And it was not so much seen as a, as a threat, but more as a vote of no confidence in this new Russian Federation that has just succeeded the Soviet Union. I think you will find um, an element of that in the current discussion of uh, the missile defenses in Europe. Clearly, no one in his right mind thinks of uh, uh, a radar station and 10 interceptors being able uh, of uh, blunting a uh, hypothetical Russian missile launch. But it is seen as, uh, as another indication that uh, uh, Russia is on the other side and Russian sensitivities um, will not be taken into account. Uh, this has led uh, so many Russian leaders and commentators to talk about the conventional forces in Europe treaty as uh, constraining uh, the Russians and not uh, anyone else. That uh, led to a, I would say, very foolish talk of uh, revisiting the INF treaty, the Intermediate uh, Force, uh, Nuclear Force uh, Treaty in Europe. But this is, I think, um, um, an indicator of uh, where Russia is, um, is moving these days. Uh, and that is also uh, exemplified by the new uh, problems, tensions in the Russia-EU relationship. Uh, in the 1990s, again, uh, there were many people who um, argued, if not for an eventual entry into the Union or eventual um, putting, putting up membership as an eventual long-term goal for Russia, but they were talking about um, a gradual adoption of uh, the European legislation as Russian national legislation, so-called acquis communautaire, which is a body of European laws and norms and regulations that Russia would voluntarily uh, adopt in order to um, be compatible with Europe. There is no such talk anymore. Uh, rather, in the 2000s, there is uh, an emphasis on uh, a partnership of equals and not of Russia being uh, some kind of an um, object of European policy. The Russians were very, um, uh, they, they, they were unpleasantly struck by, by the initial version of uh, the European neighborhood policy, which included uh, the area between Morocco and Moscow, and this, this whole thing was, um, was uh, as, as, as a field for, for European um, foreign policy. And they clearly decided that uh, this is not something that they would want to engage in. Uh, currently, we have uh, serious um, tensions between Russia and uh, some European countries, uh, primarily the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, over a variety of questions. And that uh, has uh, um, made the entire relationship between Russia and, uh, and the European Union a more difficult one. But it's still, it's still a relationship that is, uh, uh, that is uh, fairly solid in terms of uh, economic exchanges, and energy is the key word here. Uh, one of the notions that you hear coming from uh, the mouths of Moscow leaders is that of energy superpower. Let me explain that a little bit before we move on. The worldview of the Russian leadership, which has evolved in the past uh, 
10, 12 years is, is very different from the worldview of the preceding leadership of uh, Yeltsin and before that of Gorbachev. Uh, this new worldview is based on the notion of competition being the, the most important thing in the world. They do not see uh, the world as, um, um, uh, as an assembly of nice people. They see it more as a, as a, as a jungle in which you have to um, fight your way through. And competition comes first. Cooperation is, uh, um, is a successful result of, uh, of good competition. And in this competition, the Russian leadership sees uh, the energy abundance coupled with high oil and gas prices as Russia's comparative advantage. Um, they have actually resigned to the notion of Russia being friendless in the world, essentially. And whereas uh, Tsar Alexander III, 125 years ago, was famously talking about Russia having only two friends in the world, its army and its navy. Uh, the present Russian leadership uh, no, uses the same notion, but uh, with oil and gas substituting for the <laughs> army and the navy. Uh, when the Russians talk about energy security, um, it's not only about the security of supply, the Russians are more interested, perhaps, in uh, the security of demand. So they want to keep the, uh, the situ uh, they, they want to keep um, um, their proceeds from oil and gas more or less stable, and at a more or less uh, appreciably high level. The way to do that, in their view, is to um, engineer swaps between. Uh, upstream assets and downstream assets. In other words, in exchange for a share in Russia's um, oil and gas fields, uh, a share in the distribution uh, facilities, and distribution networks in Europe, which um, um, is a proposition that is meeting with uh, a lot of suspicion uh, in, in Europe. But that, that's, that's where we are now. Uh, people often talk about the energy dependence, and uh, I think it was correctly pointed out yesterday that that dependence is mutual. Uh, Europe depends uh, to, to uh, an appreciable degree on Russian oil and gas, say 25, 30 percent. But Russia depends uh, for two-thirds of its uh, uh, proceeds from foreign trade on uh, oil and gas exports. So if there is dependence, I think that it's more on the Russian side than vice versa. Um, the energy weapon. Um, I think that the Russians uh, are not ap apologetic about using what they have, and they don't have much at this point, uh, in order to get their way through. Uh, but um, they want riches, and they, want, they, 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 they see energy as a means to riches and prominence in the world. Uh, but as, um, as to the use of energy weapon in particular cases, and we talked about Ukraine and Belarus yesterday, I will mention that in, in, in a second. Um, Russia has been supplying, and this is what the Russian uh, government representatives are pointing out uh, very often, now, Russia is, uh, has been supplying uh, Europe with energy without interruption, even as the Soviet Union was disintegrating. And this is a, this is a fact. Russia has not uh, threatened Europe with uh, a cutback in gas and oil supplies. That would have been ultimate foolishness and, ultim and, 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 and complete absurdity. What happened was um, a very interesting case in which, which shows that you can be both cynical and naive at the same time. Uh, Russia was subsidizing its former borderlands, including Ukraine and, uh, and Georgia and uh, the Baltic states, 
and Belarus and some others with uh, gas at uh, much reduced prices, say a quarter of the going price in Western Europe. And uh, for a period of time, um, they thought that that was a way to keep those countries close to Russia, but uh, they were not really getting anything uh, in exchange for that uh, generosity. So they decided back in 2004 that uh, enough was enough that they would start charging uh, normal prices in relations with uh, Ukraine and, and, and the rest of them. But it, that is, uh, as this often happens, uh, they acted in a pretty clumsy way, uh, turning out to be their own worst enemies. They quoted the price uh, in the spring. They lost uh, six, seven months in uh, futile attempts to nail the, the, nail the uh, Ukrainian side to the negotiating table. The Ukrainians were evasive, and they had every reason to be evasive. Um, but then, as, as time was nearing what the Russians had uh, considered to be the deadline, they switched gears in a very abrupt and brutal manner, and they started to talk uh, the language of diktat. They thought, they hoped, that since Ukraine uh, would be, in the worst case uh, scenario, would be deprived of Russian gas shipments, the Ukrainians would have uh, uh, to steal from the gas that Russia was pumping across Ukraine to Europe, which would uh, place Europe and Russia on the same side, and Ukraine would be sandwiched between the two neighbors. And of course, uh, they grossly miscalculated, because there's no chance that Europe would side with uh, any former Soviet country, uh, uh, would side with Russia against any former Soviet country. And uh, that uh, clearly led to a major uh, uh, shock, a major uh, blow to Russia's reputation. Uh, as if that was not enough in 2006, they uh, uh, had another go at, at the same thing back in, to, uh, back in 2007 with Belarus, hoping that this time, when Russia was pitted against Europe's last dictator, uh, Europe would side with Russia, Russia rather than with, the, with President Lukashenko of Belarus. But they were disappointed again. Um, more broadly, the common neighborhood between Russia and Europe uh, is uh, becoming more and more a field of uh, uh, intense competition between uh, the Union and, and the Russian Federation. Russia, very interestingly, has become um, post-imperial in the sense that it, um, it wants to, to act, and uh, to some extent it, it, it manages to act as a great power, but no longer an empire. And that, I think, is a very interesting description, uh, distinction. Uh, the relations between Russia and uh, the former um, uh, Soviet borderlands are becoming, as the Russians call it, monet monetized. So you, 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 you demand the, um, the, the market price for the products that you sell. Uh, the name of the game from the Russian perspective is that of uh, expansion and not integration. And uh, as I said a moment ago, there's open competition for influence with the United States and, and Europe and Russia is not um, is not shying away from that. They, um, from the Russian perspective, the problem is uh, that the so-called color revolutions in uh, Ukraine and uh, Georgia are just um, uh, a technique for spreading American and European influence in those former Soviet states. Um, and uh, um, the frozen conflicts where Russia is uh, very much involved, uh, are seen as, uh, uh, as an area where uh, uh, Russian influence is being um, eased out by the uh, Europeans and Americans. So th those are the, the issues um, between Russia and Europe. And um, I would say that it's, the relationship is uh, becoming 
uh, more serious, uh, much cooler, and um, uh, prone with, uh, and, and fraught with uh, at least uh, a potential for, um, f for conflicts. As to Russia itself, which uh, used to be um, an object of Europe's and America's policies, the Russian leadership believes today and says it clearly that Russia is nobody else's business. It's just our business. And um, sovereignty has become the buzzword in the uh, uh, talk of the Russian elites. They do not regard uh, the world as being composed of too many sovereign states. They believe that the number of sovereign states is fairly small, and they want to count Russia among that number. There's a very high degree of self-confidence, even overconfidence and arrogance among the Russian leadership. It's, uh, it's a bunch of people who not only ruled the place, but they own large chunks of the place. And they've been able to get there through uh, uh, very severe competition, not very democratic, but very severe competition in their own ranks. They um, compete for partnership with the West in a very different manner than their predecessors. They do not want to achieve partnership through concessions, as Gorbachev did, nor through submission, as they say or they think Yeltsin tried, but they want to get there through competition. The ambition is uh, for Russia to become a global player, a global power, um, an all-round power, not just an energy um, purveyor to the world, but uh, equally a um, high-tech military and military power, so that Russia eventually becomes an equal partner in the full sense of the word uh, to uh, the United States, China, India, and Europe, if Europe manages to get its act together and uh, functions as a, as a single player. If Russia succeeds, um, and that is a big if, then the country which uh, used to be known as European but not Western can become Western in terms of its domestic institutions because that's the only way Russia can succeed, but not European. And the challenges are enormous from uh, demographics to democracy. But also, there is a hope. The hope is that although the story of Russia today is not the story of, uh, of flourishing democracy, it is a story of very real, also very rough, capitalism. Russia is an authoritarian country, but this authoritarianism rests on the consent of the governed for the time being. There are two major forces that act for positive change in Russia. One is called money slash private property. The other one is called uh, open borders slash globalization. There are two main threats to Russia's progress today. Uh, Left-wing populism and uh, right-wing ultranationalism. Because once you exit the empire uh, and, and be try to become a nation state, nationalism rears its head, that, that's almost inevitable. How you manage that is, uh, is, is a very important question. So for the foreseeable future, um, and this is my concluding statement, Russia will remain an interesting place, a, play, a country to watch, a country to do business with, maybe not so much uh, a country to engage, uh, but the country to engage with. Um, so I think that's, that's where we are. Thank you very much.